There is a large and growing number of unconventional therapies available to pet owners. These are approaches to treating disease or maintaining health, which differ from the conventional scientific-based medicine that is usually taught in veterinary schools. And these alternative therapies differ quite a bit from one another as well. This graphic just illustrates one way in which these practices can be categorized. Biologically based approaches, manipulative approaches, energy therapies, therapies which can really be viewed more as spiritual practices than, strictly speaking, medical practices. However, many of these unconventional approaches are employed together in combination, and they are generally talked about together under the heading of alternative medicine. There are some other terms that are frequently used. Complementary and alternative medicine is a common one, abbreviated CAM, and integrative medicine is a newer term. We'll talk a little bit later about the, the details of some of the terminology in this area. Now because these therapies are unconventional and not generally taught in veterinary schools, many veterinarians are not familiar with the details of them. And many, many veterinarians are not entirely sure how to go about evaluating these unconventional therapies. They may have theoretical foundations which are quite different from the scientific principles that veterinarians are taught in school. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide a toolbox or an approach for evaluating unconventional therapies that you may not be very familiar with. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is go through some specific examples of alternative therapies and employ our five-step process for evaluating them. Just to illustrate how the process works, I'm also going to look at some categories that I think we can generate to organize the kinds of therapies that are out there in terms of how likely they are to be safe or effective, how compatible they are with the scientific way of determining that. So again, a quick review of the five-step process. What is it? Get a little bit of background information on the, on the practice first. Is it plausible? Does it make sense in terms of what we do know? Science doesn't know everything, but we know a lot, and we should be compatible with what we do know. Evidence, does it work or not? What is the evidence for it? Are there any warning signs, things that should raise red flags for us about a particular set of claims? And then ultimately a judgment based on the totality of the information we have and uh, all of the other less objective, tangible factors that go into deciding what to do in a particular case. <clears throat> So Reiki. This is an example of a category of things that I think is the hardest to justify using from a scientific or an evidence-based point of view. So what is Reiki? It's a form of energy medicine or spiritual healing in which the energy of the universe, which is always a hard thing to define, is channeled by a practitioner into a patient. And that channeling generates healing or facilitates healing. This practice was discovered through uh, introspective revelation during a meditation retreat by a uh, Japanese Buddhist in the 1920s. And what the insight that this individual had was is that the practitioner can, can serve as a conduit for a spiritual energy that exists in the universe and offer this energy up either directly through touch or from a distance to a patient who can then potentially make use of this energy in healing. <clears throat> there are a variety of more specific theoretical arguments and techniques in schools, but that's the general practice. So does this make sense? Is it biologically plausible? Well, again, it's a vitalist argument. It's a theoretical idea that says that the core aspect of the therapy is something that science can't detect, can't measure, can't consistently, objectively evaluate. It has to be sensed intuitively. So right away, we're left with the problem of having a practice that's based on an idea science can't really say much about. So from a scientific point of view, we, we can't really say much about the plausibility of it, except that it's simply not detectable. The basic principles <clears throat> can't be demonstrated. 
and so we can't say much about it. So what's the evidence? Have we done any studies? Does it actually work? There are some clinical trials of this in human beings. This is an idea that, that has enough popularity that some people have made an effort to test them. Here's a review of several randomized clinical trials uh, on the subject of Reiki. The conclusion was, the trial data for any one condition are scarce and independent replications are not available. Most trials suffered from methodological flaws, small sample size, inadequate study design, poor reporting. The evidence is insufficient to suggest that Reiki is an effective treatment for any condition. So what's the bottom line? From an evidence point of view, we have a systematic review, which is at the top of the evidence pyramid. But generally, we have a relatively small number of trials of quite poor quality. So the evidence is limited, but so far doesn't seem to support that there's any benefit to this therapy. What limited evidence we have is negative. Here's another review of a, of a few specific trials for cancer therapy. And again, none of the studies are of a size or quality that allows us to draw reliable conclusions. The existing research evidence does not allow any conclusions about the efficacy or effectiveness of energy healing. So again, what evidence there is, which is not very much and not very good, is negative. Are there any veterinary trials? Nope. Nothing clinically published in, in veterinary medicine. There are a couple of lab animal trials and a couple of in vitro studies which looked at do Reiki practitioners, when they do their practice, have any influence on physically measurable variables in vitro or in lab animals. These were published in alternative journals which have a very high publication bias. They tend to publish almost exclusively positive studies and these all had some methodological flaws. The results were mixed. There were certainly some studies which suggested that there might be an actual effect um, and other studies that did not support this. So plausibility is questionable. Preclinical evidence is virtually non-existent, but there's a little bit and it's mixed and clinical trial evidence is quite weak and generally negative. There are of course plenty of testimonials and anecdotes. At the lowest level of the individual case, there are plenty of people who believe that this has been an effective therapy for them or their patients. Are there any warning signs that this may be a problematic therapy from a scientific point of view? Sure. One of these is that there is a single energy in the universe that applies to all aspects of health and disease and can be used in any condition. Again, I think that's a too good to be true a claim that we should view skeptically. Absolutely no risks. We have a therapy that claims that because this is a natural spiritual energy that we all interact with all day long, that, that there's no way that it can harm us. And, and I think that there's very strong evidence that anything which has no risks also has no benefits because again, you cannot tinker with a complex system and have only the effects that you want. And ultimately, it's mysterious. It says that you have to accept it as true based on your individual experience, on faith, belief, introspection, because none of this can be objectively validated. So what judgment would I make? I would judge this to be of doubtful value. I think it's unlikely that this is ever going to be an effective, documented, scientifically supported therapy. And uh, that, you know, ultimately means that I'm not inclined to use it. The plausibility, I think, is low. Science certainly can't say much about it, but it's not consistent with what we understand about how the world works. Evidence is largely absent. What little evidence there is is, is mixed but, but frequently negative. There are certainly warning signs present that this is something to be suspicious of. Overall, what's the risk? Probably quite low. I think somebody standing in front of you waving their hands and channeling the energy of the universe into you is probably pretty low risk, whether you believe in it or not. Benefit? I think there's very unlikely to be any. There's certainly no evidence yet to suggest a benefit beyond the very unreliable levels of testimonial and anecdote. So would you use it? Under what circumstances might you use it? To what extent would the urgency of a particular situation influence your decision given the high degree of uncertainty about the usefulness of the therapy? 
there are a lot of other practices in alternative medicine which I think are in a similar category, things that I think have doubtful value because they have low plausibility, because there's little or no evidence and what evidence there is is low level, poor quality, frequently negative. There are warning signs that, that these are things to be suspicious of. And I think these are therapies that we can confidently ignore in the absence of new, better evidence. Certainly people are inclined to use these therapies because they have compelling personal individual experiences with them, and that's understandable. But from the point of view of science or evidence-based medicine, those individual experiences are highly unreliable. They have consistently led us astray throughout history. And I think that it is reasonable to ignore them unless we have some other good reason to accept that a therapy has some utility. And in this case, I think Reiki is an example of a therapy that really is not worth a lot of our time and energy unless something new comes along. Now that doesn't mean that no one should look at it. If someone wants to conduct a really high quality clinical trial with lots and lots of individuals, and if they find positive outcomes, I would certainly be willing to reconsider. But at this point, I don't think the evidence justifies spending our resources on therapies like this. So what other practices are in this category? Most of the energy or spiritual healing practices. There are things that ultimately science can't say much about, and that when science has tried to look at them, we haven't found anything. So there are therapies which I think have not earned a, a lot of credence from a scientific medical perspective. Healing touch, therapeutic touch, is a westernized version of Reiki. It's essentially the same thing, but without a lot of the, the Buddhist ethos to it. Qigong is a Chinese approach. Uh, animal psychics. This is a, a group of people who will come to your clients and, and say, I can help your pet get better by understanding what your pet is thinking and what they want. I can help you make euthanasia decisions, for example, by asking your pet how they feel. And in the absence of, of any scientific plausibility to that notion, and in the absence of any positive evidence in, in an objective scientific sense that that ability exists, despite a great deal of effort, particularly on the human side, trying to validate it, I think we can convincingly dismiss that as a legitimate approach. Aura therapy, something called EFT, an emotional freedom technique, vibrational medicine, these are all things which have theoretical foundations that are highly implausible or simply not accessible to the scientific method at all, and have little to no scientific evidence to support them. Batch flower essences is another one all kinds of products based on some sort of magic property imbued into water uh, by some process that science doesn't see as legitimate. Crystal therapy, color therapy, it's actually a surprisingly long list. Products that block toxic radiation or energy. Uh, energies are often seen as as beneficial in these vitalist approaches, but sometimes the energy of the universe apparently can be malign, and so people are known to sell products to block this energy, the classic tinfoil hat approach to uh, health and disease. Wearable magnets, things that you put on your body somewhere that somehow influence health, even though science has not found any evidence that, that they actually have a physiological effect. Iridology, the practice of diagnosing all disease anywhere in the body through looking at subtle changes in the pigmentation of your iris. Reflexology, a similar idea that you can affect all body systems through particular points on your feet. Applied kinesiology, this is a practice frequently uh, utilized by chiropractors to evaluate the effect of either potential therapeutic agents or potential toxins by looking at how strongly a patient can resist the pressure that the practitioner puts on a limb in the presence or absence of these agents. And in, hum in veterinary medicine, this is frequently done by proxy. I I've seen a case where an owner will stand next to a horse, for example, and the applied kinesiologist will, will wave you know, a particular food or a particular medicine over the horse and then push on the owner's arm. And how strongly the owner resists the pressure on their arm apparently tells the practitioner whether or not that agent has an effect on the horse. Highly implausible, no evidence to suggest that there's any truth to that approach. 
and dowsing, something which I would never have thought of as a medical therapy, but there are people out there who claim to be able to gather information about health and disease through using devices like dowsing rods to sense things which cannot be detected in any objective or scientific way. And there are undoubtedly many other examples of similar practices, which I think we can legitimately confidently say, in the absence of any new evidence, have doubtful value. I'm now going to move on to one of the more popular alternative therapeutic approaches, and one which I think illustrates a slightly different category of things. Rather than something like Reiki, for which there's very little evidence, there's actually been quite a great deal of research put together having to do with homeopathy over a couple of centuries now, which makes it more challenging to evaluate and to appraise that evidence. But I think we can still apply the five steps, so we'll start by saying, what is it? What's the background to this? Samuel Hahnemann was a physician in the 18th century and is the inventor of homeopathy. He practiced at a time when conventional medicine involved a lot of bloodletting, a lot of purging or, or giving products, uh, agents to make patients vomit or have diarrhea because it was believed that the bodily humors, blood and bile and phlegm and these things were, were the key to health and disease and that balancing those humors by eliminating fluids from the body was a way to achieve health. And, and we know now through science that many of the practices that were widespread in conventional medicine at the time did far more harm than good. And so Hahnemann quite sensibly seemed to appreciate this and went about looking for an alternative and had a, uh, a inspiration at one point that he codified as the law of similars. And the law of similar says that an agent of some kind which can cause a particular symptom or set of symptoms in a healthy person can also be used to treat the disease that causes those symptoms in someone who is ill. And it appears that the insight which sparked this, this notion of the law of similars um, was an experience he had with something called cinchona bark, which was a, a treatment often used for febrile illness, including malaria at the time. And he took it when he was healthy, when he didn't have a febrile illness, and experienced symptoms that seemed very much like one of these febrile illnesses like malaria. Some people have hypothesized that he actually had an allergy to cinchona bark, which some people do, but in any case, he had the insight that perhaps this therapy, which seemed to be effective for diseases that involved fever and which seemed to cause him to have febrile symptoms, represented a basic principle, the law of similars. However, since these agents obviously cause symptoms in healthy people, giving them to people who are sick are likely to make their symptoms worse. So he experimented with the idea of diluting these ingredients to the point where they no longer caused symptoms and somehow maintained their ability to relieve symptoms. And the notion of potentization, meaning that we make a, res a remedy stronger by diluting it, is a key to how homeopathic remedies are created. They also are created through a process of succussion, which is a special kind of agitation. Uh, and I believe Hahnemann's practice was to bang these solutions on a leather-bound book. Uh, there are some actual fairly specific rules about how one shakes or agitates a homeopathic remedy when, when manufacturing it. Most of these remedies are diluted to a point where the laws of physics and chemistry tell us there are absolutely no active ingredients in them at all. The, there are no molecules whatsoever of the original ingredient in most homeopathic remedies beyond a certain level of dilution in the most commonly used ones. So that raises you know, a question, which we'll talk about when we get to plausibility, about how these things could work. And Hahnemann uh, and his successors have elaborated a number of theories for how these could work suggesting that the water in which these agents are diluted has some memory of the agents even when they're long, no longer present, 
And there are other people who simply argue that the empirical evidence or anecdotal evidence is so strong that they do work that it doesn't really matter how, and, and they bypass the theoretical questions. In any case, the notion is that remedies actually become stronger the more you dilute them, which is somewhat contrary to the general understanding of science. The process of figuring out which agents are useful for which conditions is through something called approving. And basically this is a repetition of the sort of experiment that Hahnemann did on himself, and he did many of these, where you give healthy volunteers uh, an actual agent of some kind, not diluted, and then they keep a diary of all the physical and emotional and spiritual symptoms they experience for some period of time after taking this agent. And then the homeopath, and, and for most remedies, this was Hahnemann who wrote extensively about provings, though there are, have been a number of agents added since his time. The homeopath will look at these diaries and look for common patterns and that will be how we decide which agents cause what symptoms and therefore which agents are likely to be useful in a homeopathic form as a treatment for what symptomatic patterns. What then are the principles by which homeopathic remedies are employed? How do we diagnose and determine our treatment plan? The homeopathic interview is a very lengthy detailed interview in many ways it resembles psychotherapy in that it ranges widely through all of both the physical and spiritual and emotional conditions that the patient is experiencing. Homeopathy is based around the principle that individuals are all very unique and that therapy must be tailored to individuals even though there are general guidelines about which remedies work for which sorts of symptoms. The particular pattern of symptoms and in individual experiences and the context of their life is supposed to be critical to deciding what remedies to use. There are reference resources which list the homeopathic remedies that exist and what symptom patterns they're likely to be useful for. There are what are called repertories, which are sets of symptom patterns and lists of which homeopathic remedies may be useful for those symptom patterns. So there are a couple of ways that the practitioner can use to, to guide which remedies they choose. Classical homeopathy, which is still what is advocated by a lot of the organizations such as the Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy, requires that only one remedy be used at a time because remedies are believed to interfere with one another and that other therapies such as both conventional and other unconventional therapies not be used at the same time as homeopathy. So it is intended to be the sole approach to treatment. In reality, many people who use homeopathic remedies today combine them with one another or with other therapies as well. So classical strict homeopathy is, is less common. There is a notion that in order to treat a disease one must first see uh, an expression of the body's efforts to eliminate the disease and that in fact negative symptoms may frequently emerge following therapy and that these are not an indication that the therapy is having an adverse effect or failing to work but in fact an indication that the therapy is working as intended. A healing crisis or a set of either symptoms getting worse or new symptoms arising following the use of a homeopathic remedy is seen as a part of the natural healing process. And finally, the goal of homeopathy is said to be cure. And this, in homeopathic term, means not necessarily the elimination of symptoms. That may not be necessary to declare a cure. In homeopathic terms, a cure is said to be the elimination of the underlying cause of the disease. The underlying cause, in, in Hahnemann's view, was some perturbation in the vital energy or the spirit rather than a physical cause. This makes identifying a cure somewhat challenging in that the symptoms may persist while the patient may still be viewed to be cured. So let's move on to the next step in our five-step process, plausibility. Does homeopathy make sense? Do the ideas behind it make sense? The law of similars. 
clearly this is implausible from a scientific point of view. Uh, cultural anthropologists refer to the notion that superficial relationships between things imply some deeper relationship between them as sympathetic magic. The most commonly known idea of this is the voodoo doll, that one creates a, a doll that looks like a person and that then gives one power over that person's actual physical body. In medicine, this idea appears frequently in, in folk medical traditions, and there are many examples. Uh, yellow plants have often been used to treat jaundice. Uh, walnuts have been said to be useful for brain disorders because they look like little brains. Uh, mandrake roots, which have a superficial resemblance to the human penis, have been used as fertility aids or as uh, aphrodisiacs. So it's a common idea. Occasionally such similarities do actually correspond to an underlying relationship, but most of the time they don't. So as a general principle, it's not reliable and it's pretty implausible. There's, there's no consistent pattern here. The law of infinitesimals is clearly inconsistent with basic physics and chemistry. You cannot make something more powerful by making it more dilute, by taking away the active ingredient. And as I mentioned, the dilutions that are commonly used have been demonstrated through, through reliable, well-established pr principles of chemistry to not contain any active molecules. The notion of water memory, that water can somehow remember things it's had in it, and particularly that it can remember only those things that we want it to remember and not all the other things that it's had in it, have not been supported by any kind of legitimate research. Um, it's a theoretical idea which is pretty implausible and which is inconsistent with the basic principles that all the rest of physics and chemistry and biology are based on. Does that mean it can't be true? No. But it means that for this idea to be true, most of the rest of, of medical science has to be wrong. And that seems pretty implausible. Provings uh, as the main method of deciding whether a remedy is going to be useful for a particular set of symptoms are totally subjective. Everything is viewed as potentially relevant. No real attempt is made to decide whether something is relevant or not. And there have been examples, you know, which you can find to read about provings which look at small and insignificant experiences which most of us have every day and assign those to particular remedies as key features. And I think that's unlikely to be a reliable method. Attempts have been made to replicate some of the provings that were initially done to determine which therapies are appropriate for which problems, and they've failed. So in general, one of the fundamental principles for how we assign homeopathic remedies to symptom sets seems not to be reliable or true. It's very subjective and not replicable. So overall, the plausibility is quite low. How about the evidence? Well, this is where it gets complicated, because in the last couple of hundred years, enormous volumes of research evidence have been generated surrounding homeopathy and we could spend all day talking about all the studies and their pros and cons. It's very challenging. Huge amounts of research out there. So, you know, critical appraisal is the key. The sources are also an issue. There are many sources of evidence that are clearly biased towards homeopathy and only publish positive papers, so one has to be a little skeptical. The quality of the research is often quite poor. Blinding, randomization, things like that are often ignored. There are a lot of methodological objections in general to the idea of doing this research. For example, doing how do you do a placebo control against something that has nothing in it but water to begin with? Or from the point of view of, of homeopaths, how do you do a population-based study on an individualized therapy? So there are lots of methodological problems. What can we say? Clinical trials in humans have certainly been conducted, many, many, many of them. The results are mixed. There is a general pattern. The higher the quality, the less likely you are to have a positive result. The mainstream sources that publish these papers, in New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of American Medical Association, things that are highly respected mainstream publications, tend not to have a lot of positive results, whereas journals dedicated to promoting homeopathy tend to publish positive papers. So source and quality influence the results. Here is a systematic review 
of systematic reviews of homeopathy. This is a level of evidence that we hardly see even in human medicine and certainly not in veterinary medicine. But so many trials have been done and so many reviews of these trials have been done that it is possible to review the reviews, which is a pretty high level of evidence. The conclusion was, the hypothesis that any given homeopathic remedy leads to clinical effects that are relevantly different from placebo or superior to other control interventions for any medical condition is not supported by evidence from systematic reviews. So again, you can find individual positive trials, but when you look at the balance of the evidence and when you consider quality and level of evidence, the overall balance does not support a beneficial effect. Here's another review looking at the question of whether the clinical effects that we see in, in uncontrolled trials, the anecdotal effects, are placebo effects or not. And this compared placebo-controlled trials of homeopathy with con placebo-controlled trials of allopathy or conventional medicine. Biases are present in placebo controls of both homeopathy and conventional medicine. When account was taken for these biases in the analysis, there was weak evidence for a specific effect of homeopathic remedies, but strong evidence for specific effects of conventional interventions. This finding is compatible with the notion that the clinical effects of homeopathy are placebo effects. Essentially what that says is you can find positive effects in clinical trials, but the effects are very, very small for homeopathic remedies compared to the effects that you find for conventional remedies. And the most likely explanation for that is that no trial perfectly controls for bias and for placebo effects. And so some residual placebo effect is still seen in homeopathic trials. But it is small because it is placebo, whereas the effect seen in conventional medicine is much, much, much larger because it's an actual physiological effect. Now this is an interesting review that was published in a mainstream journal, The Lancet, in 1997. And this generated a lot of interest because this systematic review and meta-analysis, which is a pretty high level of evidence, of placebo-controlled trials found that the results of our meta-analysis are not compatible with the hypothesis that the clinical effects of homeopathy are completely due to placebo. We found insufficient evidence from these studies that homeopathy is clearly effective for any single condition. So what they are saying is that overall we could not argue based on the analysis they did that placebo effects are the only effects to homeopathy. When looking at any individual indication we weren't able to find a consistent benefit. So we can't say that homeopathy clearly works for any particular problem. But overall there seems to be some effect beyond placebo for homeopathy. Given the source, which is a very reputable mainstream journal, this generated quite a lot of interest. This seemed to be a revolutionary new finding. There were, however, some criticisms of this study, and the main one was that quality assessments were not applied to the studies that were included in the meta-analysis. In other words, low-quality studies and high-quality studies were given equal weight and that might have had an influence on the results. So the same authors went back and reanalyzed their studies and applied quality control methods. The results were predictably much weaker. Studies that were explicitly randomized and were double blind, as well as studies, story, study, studies scoring above the cut point for quality, yielded significantly less positive results than studies not meeting this criteria. In other words, the higher quality study, the less likely you are to get a positive result. We conclude that in the study set investigated, there was clear evidence that studies with better methodological quality tended to yield less positive results. That seems to say fairly clearly that the better you control for bias, the less likely you are to get a positive result, so the therapy probably doesn't have a real effect. It simply is a very effective placebo, and you have to be very careful in controlling for potential placebo effects. Obviously. This is not universally accepted among homeopaths, but there's a consistent pattern to the evidence here. Veterinary clinical trials. What do we have in the way of veterinary clinical trials? Very, very few. Certainly nothing like the enormous trials that are available in human medicine. And the trials that we have are generally very low quality, poorly controlled for bias. And they are almost entirely in journals dedicated to homeopathy. 
which are inclined to publish positive rather than negative findings and inclined to accept lower methodological quality. So what do we have? There was an informal review done in 1998 in the AVMA journal of the research in veterinary homeopathy. Three positive trials were identified, three trials which seemed to show an effect. Seven trials were identified in which it wasn't clear whether there was a beneficial effect or not, and six trials were identified which clearly showed there was no effect. All of the trials were weak methodologically, so the evidence is, generally speaking, not very positive and of very limited quality and quantity to begin with, so difficult to draw a conclusion based on that. The Faculty of Homeopathy, which is a group dedicated to practicing and promoting homeopathy, claims on their website that there are 35 randomized clinical trials in veterinary species. They only cite 24, so I'm not sure where the others go. And of these, 18 are positive and 17 are negative. So pretty equivocal evidence, even from aggressive proponents of homeopathy. And again, almost all from sources which are inclined to be very positive towards the, the intervention. One more source, the Veterinary Clinical Research Database, which again lists clinical trials in homeopathy. If you select for trials that are randomized, blinded, and placebo controlled, so you're trying to apply some methodological quality criteria, four trials in dogs are identified, three which found no benefit, one which found a benefit, and no trials in cats are identified. So there's very little research, and what there is isn't very encouraging. In vitro and animal studies, there are quite a few of them. Uh, they vary dramatically in quality, and the results are variable. Some seem to be positive, some seem to be negative. So again, quite equivocal, low-level evidence. The Benveniste affair is a bit of interesting history in the research of homeopathy. Uh, Dr. Ben Veniste was a French researcher who published a paper in the late 80s in Nature, which appeared to show that an ultra-diluted homeopathic remedy, that is a remedy that cannot possibly contain anything but water, had an actual measurable effect on basophils and their degranulation in vitro. And this was published in, in a high-quality journal in Nature, so it obviously generated a lot of interest. However, there were some questions about the methodological quality, and Nature took the unusual step of actually publishing an editorial along with the paper, identifying these as potential problems and suggesting that some investigation should be done of the methods to confirm this finding. So a team went to Benavist's lab and found that unblinded subjective analyses uh, by a particular lab technician were the fundamental outcome measure, that somebody was essentially looking at these cells in vitro and deciding on a fairly subjective basis whether or not they had manifested the outcome that they were looking for, and that that person knew which ones had been treated with homeopathy and which hadn't, and in fact that person was a big believer in homeopathic therapy. So when some simple blinding was done, the effect disappeared. So this is another example of the concern about quality affecting the results and the fact that one can't really rely on any individual study. One has to look at the overall balance of the evidence. As always, enormous amounts of testimonial and anecdotal evidence. As always, some positive and some negative, but people tend to promote their experiences when they're positive much more commonly than when they're negative. So in general, anecdotal evidence almost always supports an idea. Are there any of our warning signs associated with homeopathy? Absolutely. Again, all disease is traced back to one fundamental problem, a perturbation in the vital force or spirit, and all problems are believed to have the same solution, which is to say the use of these ultra-diluted remedies based on the law of similars and the assignment of particular remedies to particular symptom patterns, which is a very subjective process. Absolutely no risks is generally a claim made by homeopaths. Uh, they will sometimes say that healing crises can happen, that symptoms may worsen before they improve as part of the healing process, but in general homeopathic remedies are considered to be absolutely safe and they are mostly available in the United States over the counter because it's understood that 
even by homeopaths, that they don't contain anything but water, and that the effects are not typical pharmacological effects. But again, one has to ask the question, if there are no risks, how are there likely to be benefits? How do you manipulate a complex system like a living organism and only have positive effects? Seems unlikely. There's a great deal of mystery involved in terms of how the vital energy is influenced by water that is somehow retaining the memory or energetic impression of an agent. There are things that cannot really be investigated because they're inconsistent with the basic principles of science. And I think that's a warning sign that should generate some... So what judgment or conclusion can we draw from this five-step process for homeopathy? I think the obvious conclusion is that it has very questionable value. The plausibility is quite low. In order for the principles behind homeopathy to be true and for homeopathy to work, all the fundamental rules that govern mainstream chemistry, biology, and medicine have to be wrong. And that seems pretty darned unlikely. The research evidence is mixed, but on balance it's very weak. And those studies with poor methodological quality and high risk of bias are likely to be positive, whereas those studies with much better quality and more strict control for bias tend to be negative. The effects seen in clinical studies, even when they are positive, are considerably smaller than are seen for conventional therapies. So the evidence overall does not support a benefit. There are multiple warning signs present. This is one of those too-good-to-be-true methods that has no risks, only benefits, and that can treat everything because all disease has one fundamental cause. And I think that sort of claim is highly unlikely. What's the risk of homeopathy? Directly speaking, the risk is probably quite low. Almost all of the remedies don't have anything in them but water, and so they can't directly do any harm. However, we have to consider the indirect risks as well. People will often eschew conventional therapy in favor of homeopathy. It is presented as a complete safe method that doesn't require any additional conventional therapy. And so people will often delay seeking out diagnosis and treatment for their disease because they are under the impression that this is helping them. So there is some indirect risk there. What are the benefits? Very unlikely to be any. So would you use it? How would you feel about this method given this balance of risks and benefits? There are many similar practices that have questionable value and have similar characteristics when looked at through our five-step process. For example, the plausibility for the theoretical underpinnings of many of these therapies is quite low. And as far as the evidence for these therapies, there's usually quite a bit on the human side, uh, just as there is for homeopathy. Often there's very scarce evidence in veterinary medicine. The results of the research that does exist uh, are quite variable and mixed. And despite extensive study and voluminous research, these therapies generally do not consistently perform better than placebo. There's also a significant association between the source and the quality of the research and the results. Sources that are dedicated to examining and promoting particular therapies and are likely to have more positive results than mainstream research sources, and the higher quality research is generally less likely to be positive than the lower quality research. These therapies, these approaches also show several of the warning signs that we consider a reason for added skepticism or scrutiny. There is sometimes good quality evidence for specific claims associated with some of these therapies, and that makes it more challenging to evaluate them. The general generalization that we all seek is, does X work or does X not work? And for very complicated therapies, such as homeopathy, acupuncture, chiropractic, it may be that that generalization itself isn't reasonable, given the complexity of the therapy and of the diseases that we're trying to treat. So sometimes there are bits and pieces of these therapies that may have good supporting evidence. Overall, they still have quite questionable value. Many of the most common and most popular alternative therapies fall into this category. 
this category where the plausibility for the theory is low, the evidence is high in quantity but generally low in quality, at least in the human field, often very scarce in veterinary medicine, and difficult to interpret, but a thorough critical analysis of the evidence looking at the overall balance suggests little to no value. Acupuncture is in this category. Chiropractic, there is some good evidence for certain very specific applications of chiropractic, but as a general rule, the theoretical foundations seem unsound and most practices and claims are not supported. Electromagnetic therapies, laser therapies, not cold, not surgical lasers, but what's called cold laser or low frequency laser therapies. Prolotherapy, which is an effort to treat joints through the injection of irritating substances. Traditional Chinese medicine, which is a whole complete approach to health and disease that includes acupuncture and some other things. From the evaluation of traditional Chinese medicine as a, a questionable therapy based on our scientific evaluation, I would exclude the herbal therapies. I think the way they are used is often questionable because their use is directed by traditional folk metaphors and not good scientific evidence. But clearly, herbal remedies are essentially drugs that have not been very thoroughly characterized or tested. And so, to some extent, there's more plausibility to there being benefits, as well as risks, of course, to those therapies. Similarly, Ayurvedic medicine, which is an Indian system of medicine that is related historically to traditional Chinese medicine and has many similar features, uh, including the use of herbal therapies. In general, Ayurvedic medicine, I think, has a very low claim to plausibility or good quality supporting evidence, but uh, one does have to look somewhat differently at the herbal remedies there. Environmental medicine, which is essentially a, a way of, of characterizing the environment as the primary source of disease and manipulations to the environment as the best way to approach treating disease. Orthomolecular medicine, which is generally just uh, high-dose vitamin and mineral supplementation. Many of the most common therapies that are in this category of complementary and alternative medicine are in this general box of challenging to evaluate and probably overall of questionable value with some exceptions here and there. Finally, I want to touch on a therapy which is currently generally in a gray zone between conventional and alternative medicine. Um, it is particularly popular in the alternative community and promoted there, um, but I think it's a good example of therapies which may do better in terms of how they are evaluated through our five-step process and which I think are at the beginning of working their way into conventional science-based medicine. So what's the background uh, in terms of what are probiotics, what is probiotic therapy? The basic principle is that living organisms, microorganisms, can be ingested by patients and confer a health benefit on those patients if they are able to colonize the GI tract usually, though sometimes other areas as well. Um, there are a number of theories for how this works. One is that certain bacteria, through ecological competition, exclude pathogenic organisms from the environment and thus protect the host. There are some uh, theories involving modulation of the host's immune system by these organisms and their metabolic activities inside the host. And the general notion that our GI tract in particular, but our body as a whole, is a complex ecology with many, many microorganisms of different species and that probiotics or specific organisms added to this ecology can promote health. There are also some limited nutritional contributions uh, from microorganisms and that's one theory for the possible benefits of probiotics. So does this make sense? Is this a plausible idea? Absolutely. Natural flora are clearly vital for normal health. That's well demonstrated. And some probiotic organisms have been demonstrated to colonize the GI tract and to have measurable local effects. So clearly the principle that one can impact health through feeding microorganisms uh, is quite plausible. There are some problems with this. Uh, the reality is that the normal flora that exist are generally unidentified. We know very little about the organisms. There are many of them and we've identified very few and we know almost nothing about the function 
of many of these organisms in health and the relationship between host and probiotic organisms or natural flora. So while there is some plausibility to the idea, the details are mostly unknown at this point and that does make us question how confidently we can make claims about some of these health effects. One in MD who's a specialist in infectious disease who I've quoted before, Dr. Mark Crisplett, puts it this way. Some ways of looking at probiotic therapy make it sound like you can balance the ecology of the gut by adding, you know, a few spoonfuls of yogurt or a little packet of microorganisms. And to some extent, given how large and complex the gut ecology is, that's a little bit analogous to saying that you can sort of rebalance the ecosystem of the Amazon rainforest by planting a putting green in the middle of it. There are some claims under this probiotic approach that have some problems from the point of view of plausibility. So what's the evidence? Does it work? Do we have any evidence that probiotics are actually effective? There are certainly quite a few human clinical trials. Many of the studies have been done on this subject. Many different organisms have been used and lots of different medical conditions have been tested. The results are variable. Uh, there are positive results and there are negative results. And so the, the jury is not entirely back on all of these therapies. There are some results which are strongly positive and for which there are is good evidentiary support. There are some which are suggestive or equivocal and then there are some negative results out there. So overall the evidence is mixed. What about in veterinary medicine? Very few clinical trials in veterinary medicine. There are some, but definitely not many. The quality is quite variable as is always the case, particularly in veterinary medicine. The results are mixed. There are some positive trials. There are actually quite a few negative trials. At this point, the negative trials seem to outnumber the positive ones. There is good evidence for benefit from some specific products for some specific conditions. And I think this is really the key to this category of alternative therapies. Plausibility is high with some caveats. And there is good evidence for specific uses of specific probiotic products, which makes it, again, more complicated than simply saying, do probiotics work or don't they? For example, diarrhea, there's definitely some evidence that diarrhea can benefit from probiotics, particularly antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Some evidence that potential pathogens can be restricted or controlled through the use of probiotics. Some evidence in veterinary trials that parasites in some food animals can be minimized or suppressed through the use of probiotics some potential growth or production promotion through these uh, organisms. So definitely some evidence of tangible benefit. There is also evidence of risk. Whenever you see benefits, you're likely to see risks. If there are no risks, there are no benefits. There are some in vitro and animal model studies, lots of evidence that these organisms have effects on cells and on the gut ecology though exactly what those effects are and their clinical relevance is a little less clear. There's a huge problem with quality control in terms of these products. Uh, there was a study published in the Canadian Veterinary Journal which randomly examined a selection of these products and found that many of them did not have in them what was claimed on the label or even any living organisms at all. So huge quality control problems for the actual products. The devil's in the details. What it comes down to is that it seems likely that these organisms will have definable and demonstrable health benefits, but specific organisms for specific conditions in specific patient populations is what we need to work out. And at this point, we have very few of those. Are there any warning signs associated with probiotic use? Only for some very extreme claims. There are certainly some products out there that are marketed with dramatic and unrealistic health claims and that are claimed to have tangible benefits that are enormous, no risks at all, things like that. And those are certainly questionable and raise some red flags. But in general, um, there are not a lot of warning signs associated with probiotic products. So what's the judgment based on our five-step evaluation process. There is probably value to probiotic therapy. It is quite likely that there is going to be benefit shown for some of these products. 
the plausibility is quite high. We know that microorganisms have an important impact on health, and the only concerns about plausibility have to do with the limits of our current understanding of what these organisms in the normal gut ecology are and what they do and how probiotic organisms can interact with them. But generally, the plausibility is quite high. The evidence is still mixed. There is some strong evidence of benefit for some specific organisms in specific conditions, and, uh, and I think that's growing. There are still some concerns and some negative evidence. Generally speaking, not a lot of warning signs that we're dealing with something that's unrealistic or that we should be skeptical of. The risks are variable. There have been some risks shown. There have been, for example, people with immune suppression who've developed systemic infections with probiotic organisms, both bacterial and fungal. There's some limited evidence that certain probiotics can actually enhance the activity of potential pathogens. So there are some risks. That's what we would expect with a therapy that has value or has benefit. And so that's not surprising. The benefits are variable, but there definitely seem to be some. So what's your judgment? Would you use this? I certainly would. I, I, I am explicit with my clients about the limitations to the evidence, but I do think that this is a reasonable therapy to employ in practice based on the level of evidence currently available. So let's look at the category that we've used probiotics to illustrate here. This is a category of things that are generally considered part of the domain of alternative medicine, but which probably do have some real value. One of the indicators of this is obviously high plausibility. The theoretical foundations are consistent with well-established scientific knowledge. And there is evidence, voluminous evidence on the human side, and somewhat less evidence on the veterinary side, but growing. There are more and more papers on this subject all the time. The results of the evidence are certainly mixed. There's no question that it's not universally positive, but there are some strongly positive research results from good quality studies for specific indications and in specific organisms. Again, the devil's in the details. And as we work out the details, we're able to separate the true claims from the false claims and find the real usefulness of this kind of therapy. There is evidence for both risks and benefits, and I find that comforting. Anytime a therapy consistently fails to show any risk at all, I begin to doubt whether it's having any effect. So the fact that probiotics have shown some risks as well as benefits in trials suggests to me that there's real activity here. There are not many warning signs apart from some of the most extreme marketing claims made for these products. Most of the specific claims made for them are unproven. The fact that for example, many probiotic manufacturers argue that normal healthy individuals should be taking probiotics all the time to improve their health. No evidence to support that at all. But there is some strong evidence for some very specific indications. Clearly, we need more and better evidence. That is almost always the case. But in particular, for these kinds of therapies, more and better evidence is likely to make the difference between there being alternative therapies of questionable value and conventional mainstream therapies with proven value. We don't need more evidence for homeopathy. The evidence is enormous and generally consistently fails to show a benefit, but we need more research on things like probiotics. Which raises the question, what happens if we get it? What happens to an alternative therapy that develops good quality scientific evidence that it, ben that it has benefit, that it works? In my mind, what happens is it becomes mainstream medicine. Clearly, if we refuse to accept such therapies simply because of their provenance, as having originally been in the alternative domain, then we're simply exhibiting the kind of prejudice that mainstream medicine is often accused of. On the other hand, if we find that a particular therapy has value and is demonstrably effective, in what sense is it alternative? if we accept it into mainstream medicine. And that will kind of lead us back to some of the philosophy and the political issues associated with what makes an alternative therapy alternative. So the question, and I think it's a good one and it's a subject for an entirely different uh, discussion, is what happens to an alternative therapy that demonstrates itself through evidence-based means? Does it stay alternative or does it become mainstream or is it a hybrid of some kind? Very interesting question which I'm afraid we don't have time to answer. So what practices are in this category along with probiotics? I think many herbal remedies. I think that herbal remedies are an area and which there is 
limited evidence at this point to let us draw conclusions, but there's reasonable plausibility that plants have medicinal value. I think that that's unquestioned. There are many, many drugs which had their origins as plants and as chemicals in herbal therapies. There is not a consistent relationship between traditional use of a plant and validated medical use. And that's a misconception that's often promoted by people in the alternative medicine community. The fact that a remedy turns out to have some chemical in it which has medicinal value, such as taxol from yew trees, for example, or aspirin from willow bark, does not necessarily validate the traditional herbal folk use of these remedies. The fact is that many herbal products have been used in a variety of cultures in incredibly diverse ways for many unrelated conditions. And when a remedy does turn out to have some chemical of value within it, it frequently has no relationship to the traditional use and it frequently turns out to be much safer to use either an isolated single chemical or even a modified version of the natural chemical than to use the herbal remedy as a whole. So I, I think that herbal remedies are appropriately still in the alternative category, but they, can, they constitute a potential source of, I think, very useful, valuable therapies if properly evaluated through the evidence-based approach. Similarly, nutritional supplements, the idea that adding more of an essential nutrient beyond the levels needed to avoid a deficiency uh, could possibly have health benefits is certainly quite plausible. Unfortunately, the research is often not done, and when it's done, it's often ignored. I will, I will say right now, which is probably going to be a surprise to most people, the evidence is overwhelming that glucosamine is not a very useful nutritional supplement and yet it is widely accepted within the conventional medical world as well as within alternative medicine. So there are definitely cases in which these therapies don't have value, but I think that they are a category of alternative therapy which could very well prove to have value in specific indications. Similarly, obviously modifying diet has an effect on health. Some of the specific dietary recommendations that are popular in the alternative community, such as raw diets, grain-free diets, have not proven to have value. But clearly the idea that modifying diets has health effects is, is quite plausible. And so some alternative dietary recommendations may turn out to be legitimately useful. Some manipulative therapies, I mentioned earlier that chiropractic does have some benefits roughly equivalent to conventional physical therapy for back pain in humans. And so the idea that massage or other kinds of manipulative therapies could have real benefit demonstrated by scientific means is, is certainly possible. And I put those in this category of therapies that probably have some value, we simply haven't worked out the details. Massage is the best example. And some behavioral therapies. There are definitely some approaches to behavior which are considered unconventional now, but which may turn out to have value. Again, all I can do is emphasize the devil is in the details. The things in the alternative domain which likely will turn out to have value are in the alternative domain primarily because they currently lack specific evidence and a sufficient understanding of the underlying details of how they work to justify using them as we would a conventional therapy. And it's only if we put the time and energy into developing that evidence that these things are likely to pay off. So we're just about at the end and I know it's been a long presentation and a lot to listen to but I want to just quickly review the main points that I wanted to make about how we evaluate unconventional therapies. First of all, we're easily fooled. We must start any process of evaluating any medical intervention, but particularly those things in the alternative area, with the acceptance of our own individual fallibility and the fact that our judgments as individuals, or even the judgments of large groups of individuals if they are informal and not rigorously structured like science, are not very reliable. We're easy to fool. Errors are more common and more subtle than we usually think or admit. We tend to see what we look for. We tend to see what we expect to see. We're really good at remembering things that show that we're right and really bad at remembering things or paying attention to things that indicate we're wrong. And 
even as smart, well-educated, experienced, and good-hearted people, we're still prone to being fooled. Our judgment doesn't get necessarily much better just because we made it through veterinary school and have been practicing for many years. The judgment of individuals, however much we respect them or however many individuals we're talking about, is always less reliable than the assessment of objective scientific research. And accepting that is the key to an evidence-based approach to alternative therapies. Science works. Again, our simple little example here, tens of thousands of years of informal trial and error approach to medicine had very little impact on the length or quality of human life. And all of these alternative therapies that have been practiced for thousands of years and are promoted on that basis are claimed to be effective largely on the basis of how long they have been around have not had the demonstrable effect that science has on the length and quality of human life. So I think it's fairly clear science works better and we should recognize that and accept that and use that as the foundation for our approach to evaluating medical therapies. We can make practical use of critical thinking, of an awareness of the fallibility of human reasoning, and of external scientific research, integrating that with our own experiences, with the values and circumstances surrounding the individual patients we deal with, and we can do this in a practical and efficient way to make decisions about the care of individual patients. One easy approach to doing this is the five-step method. When evaluating a therapy that a client comes to you with questions or information about, start by finding out a little bit about it. What is it? What are the theories or principles behind it? And then looking at those principles and asking, are these consistent with what we know? Do these violate some clearly established scientific rule? Is there a way that I could argue that this could plausibly work without violating basic laws of medicine? What's the evidence then that it actually does work? What level of evidence, what quality of evidence, what source of evidence are we dealing with? Are there any warning signs, anything that we should be skeptical of? Remember the warning signs. One cause of all disease, one therapy that treats all disease, no risks whatsoever. Those are all signs of claims that are unlikely to prove true. And finally, we make a judgment. We integrate the plausibility, the evidence, the warning signs, and the individual circumstances of our cases, the urgency that we have of, for treatment, the degree of uncertainty, we integrate all these things together and we make a decision. Do we use this therapy or don't we? All evidence is not created equal. Remember that some kinds of evidence are more reliable than others. We've talked a lot about how unreliable the anecdote or the opinion of the individual is, and case reports are a formalized anecdote. So they are a pretty low level of evidence, but they form the bulk of the evidence that's used to support alternative therapies, along with in vitro and animal research, which are also quite low level evidence. Higher level evidence, higher quality evidence is more reliable and should be deferred to when it exists. We may be in the position often of making decisions on the basis of lower level evidence because that's all we have and there's nothing wrong with that. But when better evidence is available, it should be deferred to. That's the core of the evidence-based medicine approach. What's unreliable? Individual observations and experiences. History, tradition, extrapolations from theory, common sense, things that simply must be true because how could they not be? What's better in terms of evidence? control clinical research, science. High level evidence is certainly better than low level evidence. High quality evidence is certainly better than low quality in terms of design, study size, all the variables that go into a critical appraisal. And I believe negative evidence is more reliable than positive evidence because our biases generally tend to confirm our beliefs. So when we do everything we can to study something and it disconfirms our belief, that probably means something important. And ultimately, no single study is definitive. The balance of the evidence, the overall weight, 
is more important than what any particular study says. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope it's been useful to you. I hope it stimulated some thought and some questions. And that if you have further questions, you will investigate on your own. Since undoubtedly questions will come up that I have not been able to answer in this presentation, I have tried to provide a set of resources that you can use to answer some of those. And I will go through real quickly um, some of the most common and most useful resources I've run across in terms of evaluating unconventional therapy. There are a number of electronic resources. These are certainly among the most convenient for people to use. The National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine is a government organization that has been set up, some would say to investigate, others would say to promote alternative medicine. Um, there are obviously some political controversies associated with it, but it does have a great deal of information on what evidence, if any, is available for specific therapies. Quackwatch is an organization, a nonprofit that is set up specifically to warn people about therapies which are probably not effective or which have dangers that are not often known. And that is a fantastic resource, though clearly it has a particular perspective. Science-Based Medicine is a blog, uh, mostly with physicians, though uh, I write for that as well. And there's another veterinarian, there's a pharmacist, there are a number of people from different backgrounds who contribute. And it is a place where a scientific approach to a lot of alternative therapies and the claims made for them is taken. And there's a lot of useful information there. The Skepfet blog is my own blog, and that's specifically uh, targeted primarily towards alternative veterinary therapies and to looking at those from a scientific point of view. The Skeptic's Dictionary is a wonderful resource for general critical thinking questions, as well as for questions about alternative therapies. The site put together by Dr. John Gay at Washington State University, Veterinary Medicine and the Philosophy of Science, is an excellent resource for the issue of how we go about deciding what is true and what is not true and how science has developed as a methodology. The Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine Association is a group of both academics and practitioners dedicated to promoting evidence-based medicine in the veterinary field. And there are a lot of useful resources and contacts at the, their website. And the Center for Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine is a relatively new organization in the UK, which is just beginning to produce resources and materials to facilitate an evidence-based approach to veterinary therapies. These are a number of my favorite books that look at alternative medicine in quite a bit of detail and look at the evidence for and against specific therapies, as well as the plausibility, the background, the history. In particular, uh, Dr. Ramey's Complementary and Alternative Veterinary Medicine Considered is an excellent resource, the only book of its kind, to take a really close, detailed, thoughtful, and critical look at alternative therapies in the veterinary field. There are also a large number of resources on critical thinking. These are especially useful for convincing yourself or someone else that what you think you know may not be true and that your own judgment is not nearly as reliable as you think it is. Some of these specifically address medicine. Many of them are much more general, but a fantastic set of resources that I hope will be useful in thinking about healthy self-doubt. And finally, a small collection of resources specifically considering evidence-based veterinary medicine. The Cockroft and Holmes Handbook of Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine is very comprehensive. There's also uh, a set of clinics, vet clinics of North America, both equine and small animal, that look at evidence-based medicine, and these are outstanding resources.